Hi there, so you have decided to go for a PhD. Congratulations, that's a great decision. And now one of the most important choices that you're gonna to have to make is who you're gonna get as your advisor. And so here I'm gonna talk about how to pick your PhD advisor. Now I'm gonna go through a bit of a hierarchical <laughs> decision uh, tree basically that I think if you follow that you're gonna make a good decision and considering that you know some of the hierarchies may be different for you so you can customize basically the different levels of decision that I'm gonna talk about in the following. The first step though should be you should be clear about what kind of questions you really find exciting and you should write them down. They could be like what's the role of global change factors in soil biodiversity and soil processes or something like this. So general questions, not super specific questions maybe, but if you already know super specific questions, go for it. So write all these questions that you find interesting down. I'm sure it's more than one. <laughs> and then the next step is map these questions to PIs and labs. And so how would you know that? Well, maybe you've read papers by um, authors that deal with these topics that you really like. Maybe you read them in the lab meeting. Maybe your current advisor for your master's or your, for your undergrad, they have talked about it. And you can, of course, do targeted research use web, using Web of Science or Scopus or um, Google Scholar or whatever. And you look for these keywords and you see who pops up. And so then you um, have sort of a list of potential labs and you map them to research questions that you find really exciting. Now, this is really great, and this is your pool of possibility, basically, that you're gonna draw from in the next steps where you go through various filters in a hierarchical fashion, depending on what's important to you. So the first filter may be country. So maybe you would be interested in going to a certain country or changing countries, or you're open to the possibility of changing a country, or you would go wherever. Um, a certain lab that you would want to work with is located irrespective of what country it is. So this is important for you to decide. It's an important life choice, basically. And um, there is many of reasons, many, many reasons why you would want to go abroad. And also there are some challenges associated with that. If you're specifically interested in learning more about that, I have a video and you can check this out if you like. But this is going to be the first maybe hierarchical filter you apply is like, what's my country? I want to stay in my own country, I'm open to go to another country if the lab is located there, or I definitely just want to go to a different country. Now, um, the second step is that you have these um, mapped labs basically to your research questions. You're going to check out what is the reputation of that lab. How would you know that? Well, again, maybe you have read papers in great journals that you really liked um, from a certain group, and therefore you know this is going to be a reputable lab or your advisor has talked to, the, to you in terms of this lab, or you have met people from this lab or the PI of this lab at a meeting, and you've seen they've been invited or whatever to give keynote talks or whatever the case may be. So maybe you have just already gotten a sense that this is a reputable lab. Now, keeping in mind that in the natural sciences, the reputation of the lab tends to be more important than the reputation of the university. Now, this often is the case that, um, a great lab is also going to be located at a great university, but not necessarily does a great university have labs in your particular specialty in your field because no university can offer everything, right? So the most important decision should be the lab rather than the university, at least in natural sciences, keeping in mind that many of the great labs are going to be also located at great universities. Now, if you don't already have a, basically a sense of the reputation of a lab that has popped up on your list in the pool of possibility, then you can, of course, do the research yourself, right? I mean, uh, you can go to the lab web page or you go to a search engine and you find out what have they published and in what journals have they published. Are the publications stable or if they've recently been waning, which means that maybe the lab is working on other topics or something. Have they recently worked on this topic is also important because it changes, right? Labs tend to often shift focus. And so the thing that you were really interested in other labs still working on that now. That is also something you can find out by just looking for citations, looking at the web page, looking at the description of the research that they're currently doing. If they have a useful web page, basically, you can find out a lot of information about that lab right then and there. Also about um, reputation of the PI. Is the PI maybe gotten awards? Or is the PI being invited frequently to give talks or keynote lectures? You can find that from the CV of the PI or also 
from the web page. Other information that may also be on the web page or that you can find maybe at funding agencies directly is like who funds this lab? And is the lab generally well funded? That's also something that you could use as a, an, a measure of reputation basically. But mostly I think it will be based on the papers and journals or even books that somebody has written that attracted you to that lab in the first place. So now we have narrowed it down to the labs that work on what you want, that are reputable labs. Now comes the more detailed work. So now you want to start contacting these people. So you want to write a first letter of inquiry, for example. I have a video on that if you're interested on how to best write that letter of inquiry. Uh, so go ahead and check that out if you're interested in how to do this best, because this can definitely go wrong. Or maybe there is a job that is advertised that you can apply for, then go ahead and apply for that. Of course, for that, you also need um, a cover letter and um, there's also a video for how to write a good cover letter if you're interested in this, go ahead and watch that. So, and through this process of sending inquiries and then getting replies, oh yeah, we're interested in working with you or uh, applying for jobs, you have narrowed it down to maybe a small pool of um, definite possibility in terms of you could go there or maybe you've been made an offer. And so now your work is not done. <laughs> you may already be celebrating and you should because it's great, congratulations. But I think now really don't skip that last step. You need to find out about some key things. You need to find out about the personality of the PI. You know, if you don't know them personally, or if you don't know from reliable people, like say your advisor or a close friend or whatever, what they're gonna be like, you know, you need to try to find that out uh, by video meetings with them or by visiting them in the place where they work or whatever. And, um, you know, just building yourself up an image of the personality of this person. Is, is this somebody that you would like? Is this somebody that you would like to work with for three to five years, which is a long time and it's a difficult time. So make sure this is a person that you're also gonna, gonna get along with and is your personality compatible with that person? I think those are very important things to get right because otherwise um, you can be unhappy. Just as important is the lab a healthy environment, not just productive, but also healthy. If a lab is productive, it doesn't mean it's healthy. <laughs> of course, also not the reverse. And you can also have unhealthy and unproductive labs, which is like the worst of both worlds, I guess. And you definitely want to avoid those. But I think it's not worth to be an, in a productive lab is if, the, if the atmosphere is toxic and the general attitude there is unhealthy. So how do you find out about that? It's difficult, right? I mean, you can't ask the PIs, do you have a healthy lab? But you know you have to ask people um, on one-on-ones maybe that have been in this lab or that are currently in this lab and just try to ask open questions about you know what's it like there and whatever. And so if you're lucky, you're gonna get an honest answer and that can be super informative and definitely helped me in the past. Go the extra mile in terms of finding out what this would be like. Other things, of course, like are they, do they have funding or do they offer funding for your work? Not just for if you come there, for example, for a scholarship. It means like your personal living costs are covered, but can they also basically fund your work? Or will you be limited by the lab having no money to actually fund the work that you need? If it's like molecular ecology or something, it's not going to be cheap. So you need to make sure that the funding is there. Also, what you can find out very easily during an interview generally is are they going to be open to your ideas or do they really always like narrow you down and steer you in a certain direction and basically it seems like they want the worker drone to just do this particular thing. Now, keep in mind, of course, when you are working on a funded project, there's going to be clear expectations that you deliver on this project. The project is going to maybe have milestones and deliverables. You need to do certain things. This is clear. But what should definitely be a warning sign is like whenever you have like an idea, they're going to always like shut it down. So you don't want that. I think you still want to be in a lab where your ideas and your thoughts and your creativity is going to be valued. Otherwise, it'll be frustrating. So I think this is something you can find out in a conversation. So I think if you go through all this, you're going to make a well-informed decision. And if you skip some of these steps, you might get lucky like I was, I, I didn't do it like this at all. I have to admit it was just completely, well, it wasn't completely random, but I never met the person before. I never had been in that country before. I didn't ask anybody what the person would be like to work with. And so basically it was just luck that it worked out well. 
And um, it has been a, it's been a great experience, but I think I wouldn't do that again. And I certainly wouldn't recommend it to anybody. I think really put in that extra work to make sure that this is going to be a good situation that you're in. So with that, best of luck to you to find a great supervisor. This is uh, one of the most important decisions that you're going to make because they're not going to be just there for you during your three to five years, but they're going to support your career for a longer period of time, right? They write the letters of recommendation, for example, for you. They may give you career advice for many, many, many years later. In my case, you know, the relationship goes back like now three decades. It's a very positive relationship. So I, I, I hope you all have that same experience. And I hope with this video, I could help you a little bit in achieving this. So with that, thanks for watching and see you in the next video.